victory. I like those lights. It was almost like WWE just walking in. I had my little entrance going on. I want to welcome you guys this morning. I'm Pastor Omar. If you don't know, now you do. Um, I have the privilege and the blessing and honor to bring a message today. Um, and I thank Pastor Daniel for that. But um, I, I'm not going to. I'm not going to bring a sermon. Actually, I kind of figured we can have like a five-minute conversation and just get out early. We're going to have lunch early, brunch. You guys have brunch? Let's have brunch today. I already know Pastor Daniel's in the back talking to security to already take me out of the stage. No, I got a message for you guys. God has given to me. Um, I want to uh, pray real quick. It is on identity. Uh, I know many people speak on identity in different ways, in different forms. This is my message that God has put on my heart. So don't judge me, just accept it. So let's prepare our hearts. Uh, Father God, first and foremost, we place you at the center of everything we do, Lord. As I'm up here, Lord, I declare that uh, it's none of me and all of you, Lord, that every uh, word that proceeds out of my mouth is your words, Lord, that um, all I am is a willing vessel, Lord, and you get the glory. And I declare that you soften hearts and allow everyone to receive this message in the name of Jesus. Amen, amen, amen and amen. So today I wanted to speak on identity and the important uh, aspect to know who we are. See, what, what the problem is, I think, right now in this day and age is a lot of us don't know who we are. I think we're having um, what I would say is an identity crisis. It, it, it's very hectic. If we notice, um, we're living in a state of division. They're, we're divided amongst each other. We're divided in our house. We're divided in our marriage. We're divided in the church. We're divided in the world. And what I notice is that um, we're fighting division with division. We're fighting racism with racism. We're, we're trying to justify our stance and beliefs in segregation, so we are trying to segregate ourselves. We're trying to be recognized as a culture instead of understanding that we are a body. We are all one. We are all one body. And we're not called to be separated um, from each other. We're called to be separated from the world. And there's a big difference with that. And I think the problem is, is because we don't really know who we are. Uh, we even tend to judge others, um, and we predetermine their identity. We, we, we start judging them off of their past, off of, of uh, what we know of them, off their character, off of uh, their position. But all of that derives from a place of familiarity. We, we judge them off of what we see them and what we're doing is we're creating an identity for them instead of understanding that God has already created identity for them. See, so we have a problem seeing what can be because we are too focused on what used to be. We look at people uh, like our parents. We look at people like our friends. We have friends that we won't even act like Christians in front of because God can't save them, right? Right? Because we know how their lifestyle is, and we don't want to sacrifice our friendship with them. So we want to uh, uh, change that aspect of us and act a different way in front of them because we're afraid of what they may think. Right? Because God, God can't handle them. Celebrities, God can't change them, right? Well, let me ask you, how big is your God? Okay? Because I know how big my God is. And I understand how big he can be. He can take down um, the smallest of smalls to the largest of largest. He's, he's taken down giants, okay? And so I'll give you an example. We have a man that leads in the pop culture industry, okay? Uh, he is uh, known. He has sold albums after albums. He is very famous. His name is Kanye West, okay? And what happened is, is if you know Kanye West and you followed him at all, you would say the man's off the handlebars. He's crazy. He doesn't even know what he's saying half the time. Well, now, just recently, he has proclaimed to be a new convert. He, he actually said that he's going to stop making secular music. He's no longer going to make secular music. Now he's only going to make gospel and Christian music. Um, he had an album release uh, party in, in D.C. He's all over TMZ, and he's speaking scriptures. And um, the craziest part is what I see, um, not even so much from the world, but what I see from Christians is they're mocking him. 
They're looking at Kanye and they're like, Kanye cannot be saved. This is another way for him to sell albums. They're literally making it uh, like, like if it's a ploy. Now, mind you, I'm not an advocate to Kanye West's Christianity. I don't know his walk. That's between Kanye and, and God. But all I know is my God is that big. My God is big enough to take an idol to take a celebrity at their highest and be able to utilize them to save the world, okay? My God is big enough to create an influence, to take one of the biggest influencers, convert them, conform them to Christianity, and be able to use the power and the stepping stool that they have in order to bring more people to Christ. See, that's how big my God is. But the problem is, is that we don't, When we don't have identity, it's hard to see identity. And when we forget our identity, it's hard to recognize identity. See, our identity gets lost in many ways. Our identity gets lost in ourselves. Our identity gets lost in other people and how we view them. Have you ever felt like an alone person in a crowded room? You ever felt like... um, You had friends, but those friends don't really know the real you. That you're, that where you're standing, you don't belong in that surrounding. Maybe you're seeing people for their positions and lose touch with who they are. People see the name pastor, but don't know the Daniel anymore. So today I really want to recognize our identity. I want us to be able to take a good grip, take ownership of it. And the first thing to know about your identity is to know that you are known. You're known, but by who? Jeremiah 1.5 says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Let's break that down. It says, before I formed you in the womb, right there, God has taken authority in in creating you. He formed you. It wasn't your parents doing the hippity-dippity, okay? It was literally God who formed you and then placed you in the womb. I want you to understand that. He He has designated your destiny. He has designated where to who you would be born to. He has designated where you belong, your, 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 your position, and all of that. I know some of us come from great homes. Other of us are like, God, you really chose them as parents? But you have to understand that there's a reason and a purpose for everything. But God has predetermined where you would be born, and he was the one that created you. He, if he created you and he knew you before he created you, then he already knew your stubborn, hard-headed, sassy, diva and he still chose you. He still chose to set you there, and that's the next part. Before you were born, I set you apart. He separated you, okay? He separated you from everything and everyone else, And he gave you a purpose. He chose you. I want you to understand when it says, I set you apart. Imagine you're going through a box of, you know, old nostalgic things, things that matter the most, but you have to make room. Well, he's going through this box and he is choosing you and setting you apart. You matter more to him than everything. And I know I'm speaking this message to a congregation. I'm speaking it to a group of people, but this message is such an individual message. It's about your particular identity. God does not number you guys. You are not 365,280. You are one and you are one and you are one. That's how big God's love is for us. That's how big our, our, our God is, that he can cover us so much that his attention on us is on an individual basis. He is creating and forming millions of people, but he's giving you individual attention. And then it follows and says, I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. What? Do you, do you see how big that is? 
I've appointed you to a prophet of the nations. But, but remember what he says before that. He says, before I formed you in the womb, before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Before you were born, he already gave you position. Your position was designated before your creation. He has already assigned you. And let's break this down even more. What's a prophet? A prophet is a person regarded as an inspired teacher or proclaimer of the will of God. We are all called to proclaim the will of God to the nations. Nations. That says nations. There's an S. There's an S to that. That says nations. That means we're not, we're not called before being created to, to preach the word on the streets. We are called to preach the word to the world. We are called to the multitude of people because the multitude is sin, but we know that grace covers a multitude of sin, and our God is a gracious God. So we need to understand how big that is, how big of a purpose we've already been given before we were even created. And half of us woke up feeling worthless this morning. Half of us woke up without purpose. Some of us didn't even make it to church today. So it's important to know your identity. You can't know where you're going if you don't know who you are. Without knowing your identity, you're going to either be going in circles, you're going to be standing still, or you're going to be walking backwards. And let me tell you, if you're going in circles or you're standing still, trust me, you're going backwards. The only movement and momentum is in God. So the first thing to know about your identity is that your identity is already known. So your identity starts with that you have been and always will be known by the Father. We have been chosen, but our identity only takes course when we choose him. And John 1, 12 says, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become Children of God. Give, give God a, a hand clap for that. I'm sorry. All it says is, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, who just believed in the name of Jesus Christ, he gave the right to become children of God. It is only when we choose to know God, our identity is awakened. But notice it doesn't say when you know of God or when you hear of God or when you read of God. It says when you receive him. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do an example. Christian, come up here real quick. So I want you guys to picture Christian. He invites you over, okay? He's receiving you into his house. He's saying, come over, we're gonna get to know each other. You know, I like you and, you know, I want you to come over to the house. So we knock on the door and it's like, hey, what's up, man? Oh, what's up, bro? What's happening? Good to see you, man. Good to see you, bro. He welcomes me in. We sit down on the couch. <laughs> and then nothing. No conversation. No talking. TV's not even on. (laughs) Ain't nobody cooking. Just awkward silence. Now what's even more awkward than that is me leaving, us not having that conversation or relationship, us not building that bond or connection, and me going around and telling people, that's my family, that's my boy. You're my peoples, right? But we don't even know each other. You can go ahead and sit down. Thank you. Give me a... I love, I love Christian. I love being a Christian, and I love Christian. So how awkward is that scenario? So then tell me now, how much more awkward is it to come to the altar and to receive Christ as your Savior? And that's where your conversation ends. You leave, there's no more conversation. And then now you have the audacity to walk around and say, that's my father. 
you don't even know him. You don't spend time in relationship. You don't spend time growing, trying to understand him. If that was your father and you just met your father and you realized your father had made the most ultimate sacrifice possible, wouldn't you want to do everything you possibly could to get to know who he is? So let's think of that scenario again. You're receiving someone in. When you receive someone in to your home or you receive someone into your friendship or your life, you receive them in an act of being hospitable, okay? I said that word, right? Okay. We all know I have my battle with words, okay? Hospitable, all right? We, we do things in a manner to where we, we if we are like God or we're, we are to receive, we are to give, you know, we, are, we, we call our brothers or sisters in and we break bread with each other. We have conversations. We build that relationship. That's, that's receiving somebody. You welcome them into your home. You learn about them. If you're Pastor Daniel, you give them the bad root beer. But you, <laughs> hey, but there's relationship. He's working on it. He's working on it, okay? But there's relationship. He has received you like a father so that you could be a child of God. There's no better position than that, so why are we not having that relationship with him? So now, we know that we are called to be known, chosen, set apart, and we are called to be children of God. So what else makes up our identity? Well, we are called to be like Christ. We've been made in his image. But what does that mean? I don't know. What does that mean? I feel like, like that's my conversation with Dave a lot. But what does that mean? I say something all philosophical, and he's like, bro, but what does that mean? <laughs> Genesis 127 says, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. He says it multiple times. I think he's trying to make a point, Okay. <laughs> He created us in his image, but what does that mean? That means as our father, we are called to be more like him. So as a father that I am, I'm raising my daughter to be like me. I know, it's kind of scary, okay? But I'm trying to raise her to have the best of my personality, the best of my character, the best of my choices, the best of my ethics, she already has my wife's sassiness, but even my humor. I try to give her my humor. I spend so much time with her, and she's conforming. I'll give you an example. Her birthday just passed. She just turned four, all right? And my wife has been bugging me to get a dog for a long time, okay? Now, I don't want a dog, okay? I'm not knocking you dog lovers. That's awesome. You keep them. I'll pet them and return them, but I don't want a dog, okay? And so my daughter comes in, and I'm like, what do you want for your birthday? And she's like, daddy, I want a puppy. And I'm like, ah, no, wrong answer. Let's try this again. And so um, I was like, you know what? I, I have a better idea. So I, 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 I take her online, and I'm showing her all these, like, artificial, intelligent dogs <laughs> that run around and bark, and, and you can mute them, and... <laughs> And they learn. It's crazy. They learn. Now, I'm looking at the price tag, and I'm like, ouch. But I'm like, you know what? It's my daughter. I love her. I'll get her that. You know, it's better than getting a real dog. And well, my, my daughter wasn't having it, all right? So my daughter's more like me, if you, and you'll see why. My daughter didn't want the dog that can learn. She wanted the dog that can poop. Okay? I'm not playing with you. She literally found a fake dog that poops. And that's what she wants. She wants to feed it. So she feeds it, walks it, and it poops. It even makes the sound pooping. Okay. And yes, she does have it. We did get it for her. Okay. That's to show you. Now, the best part about this is that I'm watching her and she is cracking up at the dog pooping. And so am I. Okay. <laughs> And I'm, that's because we share the same personality and humor. Now, I'm enjoying her personality because she's part of me. 
And that's what God wants to do. God wants to enjoy who he created you to be in his image, part of him. Sorry, I feel like Josh never gets a good picture of me. He always says it because I always make these ugly faces when I preach. You want to take one? Come on. We good? All right. Perfect. Sorry. <laughs> I didn't plan that, I promise. Um, where am I? Okay. So God doesn't, I want you guys to understand. Let's, serious face. God doesn't ask anything from you that he isn't willing to do. That's why he says that he has created you in his image. He asks things of you, but it's not anything that he's not willing to do because everything he's willing to do is part of his identity. See, God wants you to give, so God provides. God wants you to sacrifice, so God gave the ultimate sacrifice. God wants you to forgive others, so God forgave you. There's nothing God asks from you that isn't part of his identity. And since we are made in his image, part of ours. So let's recap. We're known, chosen, set apart, a prophet to the nations, a child of God, made in his image, and loved. It's important to understand that being loved is part of our identity. That love is part of our identity. We are built from love, created to love, in the likeness of love. You don't believe me? Let's get to the scripture. 1 John 4, 7 through 8. My dear friends, let us love one another since love is from God. And everyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. Excuse me. Whoever fails to love does not know God because God is love. If we are created in the image of God, we must be created in the likeness of love because God is love. Simple concept. But what does that mean? I want you to turn to your neighbor real quick and just tell them that you love them. Let's get a room. Now, doesn't that feel good? Half of you already feel better than you did when you first came into church. The other half of you are just upset at your spouse who turns to the other neighbor to tell them that they love them. Y'all need counseling. But we are loved, and we are called to love because we represent love. Now, what blows my mind is why do Christians have the worst rap when it comes to love? Why? The Bible talks about love more than it talks about forgiveness. Okay? It actually only mentions the word forgiveness around 14 times. The word forgive appears 42 times in the Old Testament, 33 times in the New Testament. The word forgiven appears 17 times in the old and 28 times in the new. And the word forgiving appears six times in the old and one time in the new. And so that's about 140, 141 times. But love. If you're like Christian, you can open up your King James Version, okay? And you'll see that the Bible mentions love 310 times. That's more than double. See, I mentioned that because for the longest, I thought forgiveness was the most important thing. But it's not. Forgiveness is just a byproduct of love. And so we have to understand that love is part of our identity. And what's kind of funny, as I was re researching this, if we want to stay in the King James Version for a moment, um, the first time the Bible mentions love, or the word love, is in Genesis 27.4. And it says, and make me savior meat such as I love and bring it to me that I may eat, that my soul may bless thee before I die. Now, as a fat man, I receive that, okay? <laughs> That's about food, all right? If you want to show me love, where's my steak dinner? Sean, where's my steak dinner at? 
If you want to show me love, that's the best way to my heart. Tangent on top of a tangent. Sorry, Daniel. But the first time I ever went to Pastor Daniel's house, all right, that was actually the first time I met Adrian as well. Um, Daniel made some bomb tenderloins, okay? They were ridiculous. That was three years ago, Daniel. Where's my steak dinner? Where's the love at? Yeah, breakfast, Pop-Tarts. Boy. <laughs> I know, that's why I went in the first time. Let's go. Anyways. First <laughs> Corinthians 13, it says, If I speak in tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a clingy cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. Amen. If I gave away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. I want you to understand what this verse is saying. This verse is literally describing a Christian who speaks in tongues, who operates in the prophetic, who has wisdom and faith to move mountains and sacrifices their life to the ministry, but does not have love. That person has no identity. It literally says you are nothing. So that obviously means that love is part of our identity. You are called to love your spouse. You're called to love your neighbor. You're called to love your enemy. You're even called to love your pastor. You're called to love the sinners and the saints. You're called to love because you are called love. Because if you're created in the image of God and God is love, then you are created in the image of love. So to be the image of love, it's your identity. Can I be honest with y'all? Some of y'all need to trade in those middle fingers for some hugs, okay? I'm, I'm just being real. Now, I'm not saying if somebody cuts you off, cut them off, pull them out, pull them out, and give them a hug. I'm saying just don't use the middle finger, okay? I remember uh, Sean once said that he, God had changed him in a way where he stopped using the middle finger. He started using the thumbs down. I don't know how awkward that is to get mad at somebody. They pull up on the side, and they're like, So God has given you an identity that even though you have chosen to forego that identity in the past, it doesn't matter. He has an assigned position for you as soon as you accept it to the level of royalty waiting for the moment you're going to own it. Don't believe me? Let's get into scripture. First Peter, second, uh, I mean, first Peter 2, 9, it says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellence of him who called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. We can add that to your ever-growing list of your identity. Might as, well, might as well add this too. 1 Corinthians 3.16 says, Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Psalms 139.14 says, I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Dave, come up here real quick. You know I only pick on the people I love. All right. So let's get this down packed of who you are. You are known, chosen, set apart, a prophet to the nations, a child of God, made in his image, an ambassador of love, royalty, a holy nation, his possession, God's temple, carrier of his spirit, 
a new creation, fearfully and wonderfully made. And honestly, I can keep going. But with your true identity, I would say, you're a superhero. You're a superhero. <laughs> Picture up right now. But now what? <laughs> You're in possession of your identity. God has uh, assigned you a position. God has assigned you a name. God has assigned you a title. God has assigned you the authority. But now what? What good is knowing these things if you need a weekly service to remind you? And the rest of the week you forget. There's power and reward when you take ownership of your identity. When we learn about it and when we live it out. So if God has called us to be this, then let's take our identity and let's own it. You can sit down. Second Peter's, Second Peter, I already got ranked for this. There's only one Peter, okay? Second Peter 1.10 through 11 says, Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to make your calling and election sure. So if you practice these qualities, you will never fail. For in this way, there will be richly provided and you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Faith brings salvation, but identity establishes eternity. So more than just owning your identity, it's time to practice it. It's time to live each one out. Be proud to be known by God, to be chosen, to be set apart, to be a prophet to the nations, to act as a child of God, to represent the image of God, to advocate love, to stand in a royal priesthood, a part of a holy nation, knowing that only he possesses you as you are called God's temple, carrying his spirit as a new creation because you are fearfully and wonderfully made. I will repeat that over and over and over again in the hopes that you hear it enough times to realize its truth. You are a child of God, so for the sake of God's glory, it's time to act like one.